Um, so women continue to be less likely to like reach to the top positions. And so what, why do you think this is? And um, what are some of the challenges that women face today? Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, that stat's pretty crazy. I've, I've read through a lot of the different reports of the commercial real estate. Um, you know, when I think about most firms that I know of, uh, their females occupy a very small portion. Welcome back to In the House uh, podcast. I am Jenny Woon and I am here with Tony Singh. Hey, um, we have Jenica Palachek on our show today. We are so excited to get into this because what we're going to explore today is women in commercial real estate and the value of mentorship. And um, can't think of any other person to have on our show. Welcome to our show, Jenica. Thank you. I appreciate it. I've been following you guys for a while and you guys have an amazing podcasts. So I'm so happy to be on. Yeah, thank yeah. you so much for your support and commenting and uh, the emojis that you're always posting for us. So I appreciate that. And Jenica today is going to be sharing with us her experience in both of these topics. And But before we get into this, why don't we tell listeners um, who you are and what you do? Perfect. Sounds good. Thanks, Jenny. Um, so my name is Jenica Palachek. I'm a commercial real estate agent or broker at Colliers International, one of the largest commercial real estate firms in Canada. Uh, my team and I, we service mostly tech and professional service firms. I work with a guy named Colin Scarlett. He's been in the industry for over 25 years. And so we like to think of ourselves as providing real estate solutions to business problems, whether it's hiring, productivity, retention, you name it, we try and put a real estate spin on it. Um, and it's been great so far. Hmm, that's, that's a great so intro. Cool. I think you've done it. <laughs> you've said this so far. <laughs> I, I have a few times. <laughs> um, and so going back to um, how you got into this business, like what inspired you to get into commercial real estate and tell us how you got started? Yeah, of course. Um, honestly, I had no idea the profession even existed. When you're in university, you have all these roles that are you know, accounting and finance, and you really start thinking that these are the only careers that are out there. Um, and then I worked in Espirito Santos, Brazil, and Manhattan, New York in financial roles, where I got to help companies grow. And through this, I loved being a part of the process, doing market research and looking at their business model and looking at their visions and really connecting to the entrepreneur. And now this product or this service that you I would have no idea about. Mm -hmm. um, I'll go into a store and I see it and you feel so connected to things that you were once really, you know, you would have kind of glanced over and it's really neat. It kind of opens up your world in a way. Mm -hmm. And um, in finance, I was able to take the reins with this one company, Sustainable Snacks in New York. They're sold in Whole Foods and Trader Joe's. Mm -hmm. um, and I absolutely loved it. A part of it was looking at their production space and office space. And in New York, there's a lot of things to do. And my entire highlight of that summer of that internship was helping this company look for their office space and production space. Mm -hmm. And so I knew right away, okay, A, we're probably should switch careers. Um, <laughs> and, and B, we're probably a, a little nerdy because there's so much to do in New York. There's Yankees games and the Met and, you know, I could go on and on, but that was the honestly the most fulfilling you're, thing I did. You're like focused. <laughs> yeah, or maybe, maybe just really lame. I don't know. Um, and so then I came back and I started looking at into how I can help businesses here in Vancouver with their real estate and how I can figure out um, our community and their business and their business models and, you know, everything like that. And so went on to the property management side of things and absolutely loved it. And um, it's funny in property management, the only time you're really in a client facing role is when you're probably calling them because they haven't paid rent yet. Right. So not a great conversation to have <laughs> and nobody wants to do it. And so I remember um, when COVID kind of first hit, I was super eager to take on this role and start having conversations with people and figuring out, you know, what's going on with your business during COVID? Do you need help? How can we help you? Um, and really figure out who they are as a, as a person. And I found it really rewarding and then slowly moved to the brokerage side because I loved being client facing and I also love commercial real estate. And so you get to combine the two there. And, and sorry, what sorry, year was this that you started? <laughs> um, it was, I worked in, in property management. I started about two years ago and then I started in brokerage in December. So fairly mm. new. 
Can you walk us through, it sounds so intriguing, a little bit of the process when you're client facing, you meet a client, you're investigating their business model a little bit and seeing how you can be of service to them. Yeah. Um, kind of walk us through that and then also how you integrate the real estate component into it. Yeah, of course. Um, so we've had through COVID a lot of different topics that are on the top of our clients' minds. Two of the most talked about topics are how can we bring our employees back to the office? Because now people are starting to get set up at home. Um, people have found that, you know, they no longer have to commute, especially if they're downtown parking and driving and all those things have now been eliminated. So figuring out how we can still bring our employees back to the office for that creativity and, and collaboration. Mm-hmm. Um, so we'll figure out basically how we'll, we'll be more of a consultant, I would say, over the past with COVID. Um how maybe if you, instead of having a headquarters downtown, maybe you want to change that and have a few office locations in the suburbs. Mm -hmm. So you eliminate that barrier for commuting and parking and all those things. (laughs) Yeah, it's really neat. It's been definitely a whirlwind with COVID, but it's been a lot of excitement for the most part. Yeah. You went into it, office sales and office leasing at probably a time where it was, it's on the decline. Mm-hmm. So it's really surprising that you are um, really excited and motivated to get back into this. Yes. Yeah. It's been a really strange time. Um, and I think it's been um, challenging in the best way because nobody really has a black and white answer for what's right because there's no one right answer. Mm-hmm. Every single business will look different. Some of the companies that we're talking to, they're going uh, mostly remote. Some of the companies, uh, mostly legal firms, they want all their employees back into the office. Mm-hmm. And so it's really interesting because I think it makes your job that much more exciting because every single person you talk to, you'll have a different conversation and a completely different perspective. Mm. What's, uh, just sorry to put you on the spot here. What's the lease no rate like downtown versus uh, Burnaby versus the suburbs further to, in the Tri-Cities? Yeah, of course. Uh, so Burnaby has the most sublease space currently on the market. Um, and it's been, uh, mostly like our, our top quality buildings, like the class A buildings we referred them to, they've been doing really well during COVID. Any of the class B or C, uh, especially C, which are their lower class, um, have not been faring too well. So one really interesting kind of note is that throughout COVID, when people talk about uh, lease rates on decline and mm-hmm. thinking that they're coming in and going to get a hot deal, um, because they're reading all these headlines about how the office market's dead. Well, it's really only dead in the lower end of the spectrum for the buildings, for the, the class C buildings. So for our listeners that are mostly residential real estate, is yeah. class A on a transit route? Like what, what is the definition of a class A? Class A would be where it's uh, centrally located. They have um, certain uh, years, certain maintenance, mm-hmm. um, security, things like that. Just the overall quality of the building is a lot higher. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the Class C would be the older buildings that are not as well maintained, that are a little bit older and kind of off of that transit route. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. Okay. Less less uh, preferable. <laughs> so overall, in general, in Greater Vancouver, Class C is the one that's been really affected. Yeah. Yeah. So the office market's actually been doing pretty well, especially recently for the higher quality buildings. Mm -hmm. Um, So for lease rates, we haven't seen a a huge, huge change. Mm -hmm. Um, But for the lower end buildings, for sure, they've been struggling a little bit. Mm -hmm. I've been trying to secure a space in Amazing Brentwood, which is North Burnaby. And the, the prices are like downtown. Yeah, because yeah, it's amazing. Even, when everything's around there, luxury shopping, everything. Yeah, yeah, it, it is pretty crazy. We yeah. actually helped a client get a spot solo district. Um, yeah. And it's crazy, the development in that area with Brentwood Mall, um, the new Cineplex coming in. You have the SkyTrain right there. It's uh, becoming a really desirable location, which is awesome. Mm-hmm. As a tenant uh, in the solo building, uh, I think this is our fourth or fifth year now. And every year my rent's just been going up. <laughs> I was able to negotiate a little bit off uh, last year because um, I know a, ten- a few tenants have moved out and, and they were trying to fill those spots. But but uh, this year was a totally different story. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely interesting having a conversation with a landlord versus some of the tenants. We've definitely had some more harder conversations with um, people wanting to secure really hot deals, especially if they're in a yeah, Brentwood or a really nice market downtown. And so kind of just setting expectations with what's going on in the market and, and what's mm-hmm. actually available. Mm-hmm. So share with us uh, what a typical week looks like uh, for you. Yeah, of course. Um, it's always varied. I don't think I've ever found a typical week, which is awesome and very exciting. 
Um, so a lot of it's a mix of prospecting. So a cold calling and cold email and getting new business, whether it's through uh, methods like that or also networking events. Um, a lot of researching and putting together reports for our clients. So the my senior partner and I were, I guess, like I said, a bit on the nerdier end. We like to put together a lot of, I think they're fun. I don't know if everyone else would, would think the same, but um, a lot of fun reports on real estate and different topics and how they relate I think to it's each fun. other. So fun. Amazing. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't feel alone in this. Awesome. Um, yeah, w- one of the reports that we recently put out, it's on equity, diversity, and inclusion and how mm. it relates to your real estate, which is really interesting. Um, Because a lot of companies now, they're wanting to have a more more diverse um, team. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's certain restrictions also on raising capital if you don't have a diverse board and different things like that. So there's a lot of push from all different angles on having a more uh, diverse team. So now we're trying to figure out how we can help through the lens of real estate, which has been awesome. Mm. Um, and then a lot of it's meeting with prospective clients, um, office tours, which is my favorite part. Um, and then prepping for and going to doing like financial models, anything to really help the client figure out what space is best for them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Do you work with a specific sector? Yes. Um, mostly uh, tech firms and legal firms. Mm, okay. And what do you, where do you see the future going for, for commercial real estate in Vancouver compared uh, to, really- I guess, relative to like the rest of Canada? Yeah, of course. I think we've been really lucky. Um, Some of the brokers that I've talked to globally at Colliers, some of them in Toronto, they've been on a lockdown essentially on and off for the past, you know, two years. And unfortunately, um, you know, I think it's been really, really tough on the market just because when you're constantly opening and closing like that, you have no real clear pathway of what the future does look like. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think it's been a lot more rough on the East Coast or anywhere where they've been locked down for a, a lot longer than us. Um, we've been really lucky. I think that um, obviously everything's not perfect, but Vancouver, our, our commercial real estate industry, we still have the lowest vacancy rate in all of North America. So absolutely uh, incredible. And uh, in regards to those specific divisions, uh, tech and legal, I think that they'll probably take very different routes. A lot of our legal clients that we're talking to, um, right now at least, they're doing, they have everyone in the office on a rotational basis. Mm-hmm. Um so it's a lot more focus on returning to the office and a uh, focus on kind of, yeah, returning still a lot of them are expanding. Mm-hmm. Whereas I think a lot of the tech firms are taking a bit more of a, a different approach and more so, you know, work where you can be most more productive. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it really depends on what works best for your company. What employees want and what employers want will be completely different sometimes. So figuring out how to, to really work with that. Thank you for that. Jenica, um, I know you touched earlier a little bit about diversity, so I want to segue into that. So thanks for bringing that up. Um, but a very serious topic this time, and unfortunately, not often, you know, we we want to talk about this more and more um, in, in to have an open dialogue. So organizations like Crew Network, the commercial real estate uh, for women, are at the forefront of achieving like gender equality and mm-hmm. greater diversity. Um, they're affiliated with like over 70 um, 70 associations or partners across North America. They're striving to bring more women into the industry. So it's very obvious there's a significant um, gender imbalance in this business. And, and so I was reading through a, a stat and they put out a report in 2020 called the benchmark study on gender and diversity. And, and uh, these are, this is a, a stat right from the report is that women occupy 37% of commercial real estate income, which in which their income has not changed over the last 15 years. Salary gap is 11% and commission gap is 59%. Mm. Um, so women continue to be less likely to like reach to the top positions. And so what, why do you think this is? And, um, what are some of the challenges that women face today? Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, that stat's pretty crazy. I've, I've read through a lot of the different reports of the commercial real estate. Um, you know, when I think about most firms that I know of, uh, their females occupy a very small portion and I think they also honestly have a higher attrition rate as well. Mm-hmm. And so I think that some of the challenges, um, a lot of the female brokers that I talk to that have now moved to the landlord side of things, so they've moved out of brokerage, um, they left around the time when they were starting a family because they felt like it wasn't 
possible for them to have a successful career in commercial real estate and also be a mother. Um, so in commercial real estate, since we are full commissioned, um, I think that the mat leave conversation is is fairly challenging, figuring out how to compensate your employees and then also figuring out the relationship part. Because even if your your broker is you know at home for now a year paid, when she comes back to the industry and so many things have changed, maybe the market looks completely different or new relationships have been built. Um, I feel like you're already kind of putting her at a, you know, she's already starting so far behind. And so during that mat leave, I think it's really important to provide maybe educational resources or online networking events or things like that to kind of keep someone in tune with what's going on and feel like they can really come back strong. Mm-hmm. Um, I think recruitment's also a big thing for getting females in the industry at least traditionally, they used to hire more so based off of relationships and who you know. And when you hire like that, there's a lot of pros because you probably know the person pretty well, but, um, and hopefully can speak to their character on a, on a good note. But there's also a lot of cons because if you're hiring everyone, you know, Jack and Sally's friend, they're all going to be like, like them. And you're not really going to get any diversity. And with that, since there's so many males in the industry, if they're all hiring friends, there's going to just end up being so many males in the industry and not many females. And so I think it's really important to expand your recruitment to, to off uh, to universities and to colleges and just let people know that this career exists because for myself, I didn't even know it existed. Um, the only reason why I knew is because I was in property management. And then I just kind of coincidentally um, started learning about brokerage and the other divisions at Collier's. But mm-hmm. I think that that would be really great. It's definitely um, something that I think a lot of people are talking about nowadays, especially leaders in commercial real estate. And it's definitely um, challenging to to balance all the different moving parts. Do you see um, having di- a diverse like talent or um, skills that women carry would benefit some of the companies? Definitely. Um, we, I was actually on a call with our president of brokerage and then our managing director in Vancouver. And we were talking about females in the industry and some qualities that I think females just naturally are great at. And one of them is, I think in any service industry, whether you're in residential or commercial or whatever you do, um, is being empathetic. And I think that women are really good listeners and they're also really empathetic and they can understand their clients' needs and the challenges and maybe some of the hesitations they have, I think better than some of their other counterparts. And so I think that's a really huge win. Mm -hmm. And then also just being able to be a really good listener and figure out what your client actually wants and sometimes what they want, but they're not maybe saying and pick up on that. Since Mm -hmm. that's our biggest strength and perhaps, you know, what one of the weaknesses that men would have, would you say that there's a lot of deals that would have fallen apart because of that? Yeah, I definitely think that could be the case. I think that if you, you know, especially during COVID, so many businesses have had so many challenges, whether it's financially or figuring out what to do with their employees. And, um, you know, do we, if we're, if we're facing, facing financial difficulties, what do we do with our employees? Do we have to uh, furlough them? And so it's, I can't imagine how difficult it must be for someone to grow their business and this be their baby. Mm -hmm. And now um, all these, you know, challenges are kind of coming up out of left field. And so I think it's really important to sit down and be empathetic and and not push someone into uh, making a decision if it's not right for them. So I think that for sure, if you, you know, lack of empathy could definitely uh, make a deal go south. Mm -hmm. So what advice do you have for women who want to get into commercial real estate? Of course. Um, I think it's talk to everyone. I think it's really important to talk to people um, from different firms to get a feel of different cultures because every firm does have a different culture, I think. Um, And then also maybe talk to people who have left the industry as well. Um, That's something that I think is really important to do. And I never did it, but I wish I did for any role um, because I think then you get a more well-rounded image and you see both the, the pros and also some of the challenges. And then you can really look at it Uh, from a fuller picture and say, can I really take this on and do well at it? Mm -hmm. Um, And then also any of the networking events, like attending um, crew events, women in commercial real estate or NAOP events or any sort of real estate events where you can kind of connect with people and get a feel of who you might be working with, who you might be seeing, what job opportunities are out there. Um, I think that'll all help you uh, really get into commercial real estate and learn more about it. Um, I think you hit it really, really strongly on the head there about the networking and, and the prospecting. Um, I think every company and business needs that in order to grow their network. Are there any other skills in terms of like education 
um, that you think would particularly benefit a commercial realtor? Uh, For education, honestly, it's interesting because I came from the perspective, especially working in finance, that you know, you you get your bachelor's in business with a concentration in finance, whatever it might be. You might do your CFA or you do some sort of designation like that. And then maybe you do your MBA if you want to climb up the ranks a little bit quicker. Where in commercial real estate, um, it's so different because some people have degrees that are so varied. Some people have arts degrees. Some people um, have gone to university. Most of our people have now gone to, to university, but some of the older brokers, they went straight from high school into brokerage. Mm-hmm. So um, I think honestly... A lot of it is uh, soft skills and things that you can learn on the job. Um, And unfortunately, there is no commercial real estate degree or anything. So um, that would be very useful to be able to review leases and negotiating tactics. It's a lot like like residential though too, right? Exactly. (laughs) Yeah, it's it's similar to residential, I think. I think that it's a a lot of building soft skills and people skills. And um, I think if you do have a finance background, it can probably help a little bit with um, working with some of the numbers for your clients. But other than that, I think... Honestly, wherever you come from, you can do well at it. Do you know what's funny? Mm-hmm. I'm I'm looking at Jenny right now, but Jenica, I always actually <laughs> wanted to be a commercial broker. Oh no! When way. I started yeah. in come real join. estate, yeah. <laughs> when I started in real estate, and my dad, who started in commercial uh, and then did residential, told me not to. Oh my gosh! Wow, that's funny. I <laughs> I I've shouldn't have heard that from <laughs> a few people. I think that they they know how challenging it can be sometimes. Yeah. So when they're when their daughters or sons <laughs> want to go into it, they're like, oh, no, maybe I think maybe I could have done it. I think I could have done it. But he he had told I me. Think I think he, he was worried. It. I think he was worried. He said it was very cutthroat, a little bit different very. than residential. But I find residential can be also very cutthroat. So you're And you're really cutthroat. Am I? Yeah. <laughs> I'm really kind, I promise. You're kind and you're cutthroat. <laughs> you just like, cut catch people that way. So what would you say, Jenica, is the, the biggest misconception about commercial real estate since – that was actually a perfect segue, right? It's like, oh, don't don't get into commercial. But what's the biggest misconception about your industry? Um, I think the biggest misconception is the personality that you need to have. Um, I think a lot of people think you need to be super aggressive. You need to love to golf and drink beer and <laughs> essentially be a frat boy, um, which unfortunately I'm not. Surprise. Um, but I think that there's this, this um, yeah, there's this bias that, you know, you have to be a male to be in it and you have to be this personality type and you have to be an alpha. And if you're not, you're not going to do well. And I think honestly, um, you can, you know, the person that I work with, he's more of a a data driven guy. He loves his financial models and his reports and he does really, really well. He's one of our top brokers. Um, so I think that you can have, you can really, you know, have any different personality type and do well, just as long as you're, you know, you push hard and you have good intentions and, um, you can take a lot of no's. I love and that I you said that. Take a lot of no's? Well, just the personality. I mean, there's no oh, yeah. specific blueprint for success. And also, yeah, exactly. rejection is key. You just get over it. It can yeah. be learned. You have to have a yeah, tough skin. Yeah. Yes. It's developed yeah, over time. Do you guys cold call as, as residential agents at all or cold? Yes. I do. I do. I love it. It's so fun. I'm it's so fun. Thanks. Do you know how many no's that I would get before I yell? I like it too. <laughs> it makes the yes that much better. Well, you know, it's funny. It's a mindset thing too, right? Because then yeah. it's kind of like a numbers game. Maybe if you're contacting 90 to 100 people cold, you might get one to two leads. But yes. then if you're really looking for a solid lead, that's what you'll find. So instead of looking at numbers, maybe I need to contact 90 to 100. It could be the first 25. You get an appointment. Do you find that too? (laughs) Yeah, I think that a a lot of our juniors, um, you know, they they don't really like the cold calling or cold emailing aspect. Mm. Um, But I think that it's really important if you make it a little fun and just realize that it's nothing personal. Someone says no to you. It's not to you. It's to your service. They just don't either see the value in it right now, or maybe they're busy. There's a million other reasons. Um, so to kind of view it from that perspective and make it a bit more of a game versus something that's so personal, I mm-hmm. think is really key. Can I ask a question? That mm-hmm. could be yeah. Fun. What's the craziest memory that you have of somebody saying no to you or being really rude about not wanting your services? Mm-hmm. Um, I, I've been really lucky. I think that I'm pretty, when I do email or cold email, I try and have something of value that I know that they'll want, or that will be somewhat interesting. Mm -hmm. I'll do a lot of research on the company. And if they're talking about their equity, diversity, and inclusion strategies, I'll send a report and it has some really neat stats and and findings from leaders that we've talked to. Um, So 
I think I've been pretty lucky to have no crazy stories yet. Cross fingers and knock on wood. <laughs> I'll knock on wood for you. <laughs> yeah, watch me have a, a crazy call after this one. Um, yeah. But I think the the only one I've had are people being very firm with, I don't have time for this right now. or um, Which is fair. You know, you, yeah, just something that's ne- never rude, but just more so, you know, no, not right now kind of thing. Or I can't, I can't do this. Mm, I'm just curious, why are a lot of commercial listings off the table, like not public? Well, oh, yeah. So we use, um, I know that all residential realtors, if they also dabble in commercial real estate a little bit, sometimes they use space list or a few other MLS okay. um, where we will post it on Altis um, and it's all commercial real estate spaces on there. Um, I really don't know the reason behind that, but I would love to learn more about it too. Do you guys use commercial edge as well or not so much? No, not so much. No, I haven't used so it. That's like okay. our version. No, <laughs> and that's why we don't have access to a lot of the listings. You can if you subscribe, I think, to Altus though. If we subscribe. Yeah. I, I have a separate question yeah. unrelated to your job specifically. Yeah, of um, course. Can you tell us a little bit more? So you're, you're a mentee at Crew? Yes, um, <laughs> at Crew and Colors and Naop. Okay. Can you tell us a little bit more about your experience being a mentee with all of these organizations um, and I guess how it supported you supported you, and, and kind of what that's been like? Yeah, of course. Um, so I've been a, a mentee with the Board of Trade, Crew, NAOP, and Colliers. Um, really anything that has a mentorship program and could be valuable, whether it's in commercial real estate or business aspects, I probably joined um, and I think that it's so vital because when you're first entering the workforce, I think that we like to think that we know everything or, you know, mm-hmm. you've done your four or five years, you know, you want to go into finance cause that's what you concentrated in. You're so sure about it. Um, and then you actually get the job and three months in, maybe there's things you actually don't like about, it, or maybe there's another career that's way more fulfilling for you. And so I think when you have mentors, they open up your eyes to a lot of the, the things that you're good at, the things that you challenge, uh, are I know are challenged with and different career opportunities as well. Um, I think they can also open doors for you that maybe you can't, especially when you're in that stage of your career. Um, so a lot of my mentors, if they, if I've ever um, told them, you know, I'd really like to get involved with this. How do you think I can do it? They'll help strategize with me. And if they do know someone, they've always been really gracious to be able to connect me. Mm-hmm. And so I think um, having a mentor is really vital to open up your your mind and to also open up any opportunities in terms of career or volunteering. Mm -hmm. What are, what would be like the top three factors that make a relationship successful between a mentor and a mentee? Yeah, of course. Um, open communication for sure. Um, I think that I've learned that, you know, someone can't help you unless you ask for help. They can't read your mind. You have to figure out, Hey, this is what I'm, I'm being challenged with. Um, what, how would you go about this? Um, and be okay with sharing your challenges and successes and also be sensitive to their time too. Um, trust is a huge one. I think that, um, you know, being open with, yeah, what, what you're, um, sharing personal things. Um, I know my mentors have been, I have a lot of trust in them. I've had some bad days before where I've definitely called them and, you know, say, Hey, how would you go about this? Whatever it might be. And so being able to kind of be vulnerable with them, which, you know, every, some people are really good at it. Personally, I, I struggle with it a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, so figuring out that, you know, it's okay to say that you're having an awful day and whatever it is and share this with someone and it'll make you feel so much better in the long run. Um, and also being flexible. So obviously they're really busy. Most of these mentorship programs are on a volunteer basis. So they're doing this not because they're getting paid, but because they simply want to be there with you. And so if something comes up, be completely flexible to their schedule, be understanding, be empathetic, like we talked about, um, and just be really grateful that you have them to be able to help guide you and coach you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And you're a mentor yourself. So like you mentioned, it's a volunteer position. So what does that commitment look like? And what benefits does a mentor get out of it? Um, So they're all pretty varied. With the big sisters, the mentorship program you meet weekly um, through crew it's monthly and through callers at my work, it's biweekly, um, which I really like because I think that depending on what it is you're helping the person with, sometimes you'll want to meet monthly or or more often or less often, Mm -hmm. um, with the big sisters as a mentor, um, when you meet weekly, it would be a lot of, um, helping guide, uh, youth, help coach them, share information about your, your career path, um, just overall be a role model and a bit of a confidant for them. I know that with the big sisters, it's aimed at helping, um, 
youth grow who come from more challenging backgrounds. So helping them with whatever they're going through and really just being that support if they don't have that fully at home. I love that so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How has, I mean, I imagine it's impacted you a lot and in your career choices as well. So can you describe how that feels and, and uh, if you've made good decisions or avoided bad decisions from it? Um, For being a mentor, I'm surprised at how much you learn. I always kind of had the conception that if you're, you're the mentee, you're the one learning. If you're the mentor, you're the one teaching. Um, and from being a mentor, I think that you learn so much about, um, like I had a, a mentee and she was 10 years old and just little things like being able to, to take a step back and, um, you know, whatever it is, disconnect for a day or learn things about yourself or, and, you know, they have such a simplistic way of thinking sometimes when you're dealing with youth. And I think it brings that spark back into you. Mm-hmm. So I think honestly it rejuvenates you quite a bit. And it's, it's awesome being able to learn about someone's past and help guide them through their growing years. Being a, a mentee has been awesome because um, uh, my mentors right now, they are pretty varied. One's a broker like me, um, another one's in the development side and another one is on the construction side. Um, and it's great because great. you're able to learn about different perspectives of the same industry and, um, also learn about, you know, how they got into whatever career path they're in now. I think it also opens up your mind to know that, you know, there's, uh, no too big of a risk that you need to take a lot of, I think when you're young, you're scared to take risks and you're scared to take, cha- you know, have challenges. And like we talked about, you're kind of scared to get uh, told no, and when you have mentors who've been told no or faced, you know, way more challenges than you have, I think that it kind of uh, builds your confidence in yourself sometimes. And also having that support, someone believe in you. There's definitely days, I think, in real estate for everyone, mm-hmm. whether you're in residential or commercial, where you have tough days. And if you're getting told no throughout the entire day, um, for sure, sometimes you're not going to have, you know, be in the best spirits. And so having someone believe in you when you have kind of lost that faith for a second mm-hmm. is really important. And it just allows you to bounce back up and, and keep going. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's so great that you're involved in like such a uh, wide range and with different backgrounds, um, to be able to get a lot of insight and, and, uh, it's the best investment you can give yourself because mm-hmm. it doesn't cost you any money, just your time. Um, yeah. so that's a, so it's a great way to approach it. Yeah. It's amazing too, because a lot of the mentorship programs, they also offer a lot of networking events, a lot of educational seminars. Um, so you don't only really get this, you know, unwavering support from someone who you look up to, which is incredible. Um, and someone to really just share everything with, but you also get a lot of, uh, learning opportunities and being able to meet other people in your similar place right now through networking opportunities too. So Mm -hmm. it's great. It's awesome. Well, um, I know that you have appointments, uh, for today and, um, do you have time for just our five rapid fire questions? Sure. Of course. Okay. This is going to be fun. I'm excited. (laughs) What's your current read? Current read, uh, confidence code. Confidence code. Okay. Um, My mentor recommended it. You like it? Okay. (laughs) What is one advice you received from a mentor that has stuck with you? Um, Honestly, keep going, keep pushing. Mm -hmm. Um, There's on your bad days, you just keep going. Nothing will ever last forever. Um, So on your bad days, they won't last forever. You'll wake up tomorrow. It'll be done. It won't be as big as it seems today. On your good days, also keep going, use this momentum Mm -hmm. and use it to build yourself better. Would you say that's like grit? Um, perseverance, resilience. Definitely. I think it's having a lot of grit for sure. Mm. Who inspires you? Um, So many people inspire me. Um, There's Marianne (laughs) Pai in commercial real estate. She's one of the top commercial real estate brokers uh, worldwide. She's done over 110.2 million square feet of transactions. Absolutely incredible, powerful woman. Um, And she came from the Bronx And her Uh, family was working class. She was in art school, which is also really incredible. And she just had um, a lot of grit and tenacity. And she started in working in certain cities and areas that weren't that desirable. And then she just mm -hmm. kept building herself and um, has now become one of the most successful women to ever exist. So amazing. Really inspiring. Um, One thing, sorry to to divert this, but one thing I... um, that I heard you mentioned in square footage, that's how you guys measure success. <laughs> is that, is that the best way to describe it? 
I think people do it differently. Um, so I've heard a lot of uh, people use square footage. Um, people also, I sometimes see people say that they've done whatever it might be, 77 million in transactions. So they'll either do uh, the square footage or the percentage in transactions typically. I think square footage might make sense though in commercial real estate though, right? Because you're looking yeah. at things like triple net if you're leasing or you know pre- the price per square foot for the calculations, yeah. right? Yeah, square yeah. footage is the best way to be able to actually compare, I guess. Uh, describe yourself in three words. Um, curious, um, passionate, and tenacious. What's your dream <laughs> for you. the future for women who aspire to get into commercial real estate? Yeah. Um, my dream would be that there is no bias anymore, that there are more women in the industry, first of all, um, that that gap that you talked about, the over 50% decreases, um, that women feel like it's a place where they belong, where they can come and where they can be successful without Mm -hmm. all these challenges and barriers. We're so happy to have you on. And uh, final question, where can our listeners find you? Um, You can find me on LinkedIn, um, just LinkedIn and then slash Jenica Palachek. You can find me on Instagram, jenica.palachek, probably everywhere. My senior partner (laughs) has an awesome website. It's colinscarlet.com. And it says a lot of his clients and the insights there as well. So Awesome. And Palachek is P-A-L-E-C-E-K with no You've got it. Okay. Um, Yeah. Thank you for coming on our show. I know you're super busy, but uh, we want to keep in touch. So, um, and- Congratulations and and uh, all the all the best with your uh, success in this business and and thank you so much for advocating for women mm-hmm. in this business. Thanks, thank Jenica. you. Yeah, and thank you guys for having me. I've been following you for a while, so as soon as I got the message from Jenny, I was really excited because <laughs> uh, I've been following all of your podcasts and they're absolutely incredible. So I really appreciate the opportunity to join you guys and especially joining this discussion around commercial real estate. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jenica. Talk to you soon. Thank Bye. you.